It is Wednesday afternoon. It is June 16th, and I know that for a fact. It is June 16th, 2021, our Wednesday afternoon Bible class, and I say it to you that way because I believe in giving honor where honor is due. I'm going to take you just for a moment, not to the stars. I'm going to take you back in time. I'm going to take you to probably the year 1967. If it was not, it was right around 1967. You can do the math to figure out how long that is. I'm not going to try to do it right now. But my point in saying that is the Wednesday Bible class, its inception was in 1967-ish by my mom. And today just happens to be her birthday. So happy birthday, mom. <laughs> and it is my honor and privilege to carry her class on for her. She started it when she was asked by a friend. I had someone come knock at my door. I didn't know how to answer them, but I knew they weren't right about the Bible. Would you come teach me? And that started the class. Years later, my mom and I team taught, and it's been my privilege to carry it on ever since. So I want to honor her memory. I want to honor the training that I had at her feet. Oh, my goodness farther back than my memory goes. And I thank the Lord for giving me a heart that hungered after what she had to share. And she and my dad, of course, too, but it's her birthday, <laughs> poured into me. And then, of course, I had other teachers, too, but the main teachers I had really were my mom and dad did the Holy Spirit. And I just want to praise him and thank him and honor her memory. And in honor, teach on her birthday because she would have loved teaching on her birthday. That would have been a joy to her. And I see Em lighting up his avenue in my mom, so she knows exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> and Roger, you my mom too. I'm no, sorry. I to you. Oh, yeah, got it. Between my mom and dad, I have over 2,000 cassettes of their teachings. I'm trying to get them digitized and getting them out. Mm -hmm. Lord, help. That's a huge project. <laughs> anyway. Now, back on target, we are doing the gospel in the stars. We know that, that God has shown that his message, his time plan throughout eternity, mm -hmm. from the past to the future, going from the first book, which talked about the Redeemer and his sufferings, to the second uh, book, which talks about the redeemed, that's us, going to the third book, which will talk about his coming back, ruling and reigning as king in all his glory. All of that given to us in the stars. It's not a study of astrology. That's the Satan's counterfeit that he puts out there. He can't do anything original. So he takes what's of God and he warps it. He twists it. He lays in just enough truth like that spoonful of sugar to make the medicine. Mm -hmm. yeah. We stay as far away from his astrology as possible. The only way you'll hear any similarity is in the names of the constellations. But when we get into the meanings of the names and the stars, we see the story unfold. Last time when we were talking about it, we had talked about, we were to the sign of Capricornus, called Capricorn today, but in the past called Capricornus. But this is the blessings being procured for the believers. And we saw that that's in the second book, talking about the redeem, the result of the Redeemer's suffering. He didn't suffer for nothing. He didn't go through the pain of the cross for nothing. He went through that to raise us all up into newness of life. He did that that he might receive a whole family that we could become children of our Heavenly Father and joint heirs with the Son of God in the future plans that God has for us. It is an amazing plan. In the second book of four constellations, remember there's four in the first book, four in the second, four in the third. The second book starts with Capricornus and it ends with Aries. In between are two that are going to deal with fishes. Uh, when we see Capricornus is the fish goat, we see the dual, the dual nature in this, but in the goat part, we see the sacrifice. The day of atonement, Yom Kippur, the two goats, one would be uh, uh, slaughtered. Sacrifice, that's the word I want. When would be sacrificed for the sins of the people that they're cast out into the wilderness, taken away, not ever seen again, a picture of our sins and carried away. When we get to the other side of this book where we have Aries, Aries is the ram. Oh, I forgot to tell you, even though we see the death picture in 
in the goat part, the fish part, we see up in the flight. And we'll go more into that, I think, today. We'll at least review it. Then when you get to Aries, Aries is the ram or the sheep, the lamb. And that, again, is another animal of sacrifice. We see repeatedly the sheep that, that were sacrificed. We know uh, Passover, Pesach, Pesach. And that the Lamb of God came to take away the sin of the world. Pictured in Isaiah 53, the, the sheep led before its shearers in silence, etc., etc. So we have on both sides of this book the uh, sacrificial animals giving their lives for the people who we see in the two books in the middle. We're going to see the two, uh, I'm sorry, not books, the two constellations in the middle. We're going to see that both connected with fishies or fishes, however I should say that, that's the people who the atonement was made for. So again, just in that, that quick review of uh, Capricornus, we saw the, I think I've said, we saw the, the head of the goat, the sacrificial animal, we saw the fish tail pointing up. It's like the fish coming up. That's showing a defendant new life. Uh, we'll see more of that detail as we get into, uh, yeah, we have not done the constellation under Capricornus. So that's where we're picking up with new material today. I've given you the review. We'll be picking up with the three decons that are under Capricornus. It's page three on your outline if you need that. If you don't have that line and I have not sent it to you an email from my Zoom family, that means that somehow we're not communicating, so you need to work with me to get that, uh, that communication line going so you get everything you need. Roger will be putting up more pictures than just the chart because we blow up uh, to see a little bigger and a little better. But remember, the pictures are, uh, those are man-made. Man that, that connects the dots to help us understand. It's the meaning of the names that give us the story that's being told. Uh, but it's a beautiful picture for a tray. It's just that someone wants to draw an animal a little different or something, that's okay. If you look at one chart and it's one way, you look at another chart and it's another way, that's okay. Roger's got a split screen up here right now. On my left, your right, in the dark sky, you see the, the Capricornus, you see the goat head, you see the fish tail. But if you notice kind of like an upside down triangle, it just went away. Yeah, <laughs> oh, he's sharing it. Okay, I thought it was being shared. Okay. If you see that blue, like upside down triangle, right? Yes, in there, that's the stars. The rest of it's what they've drawn around it to understand the picture and what the star means, the names are given to us. So I don't want anyone to misunderstand, especially because we're going to come into time where we're going to look at something. We call it one name today. It's got a more scientific name that everybody knows, but we're going to see there's even a slightly better name for it than that. So we, you know, what I'm trying to tell you is what's inherent is the word of God. The pictures in the sky are not inherent, but the story they tell is the word of God. Okay? So we're going to look at, at Sagita, the arrow, for our first one. And when you're looking in the chart, you are going to, uh, okay, so I need to get the fish goat to begin with, which is here. Okay. The fish goat I'm putting down here. So we're looking this way. The fish goat at the bottom of the chart. If you go up just a little bit, uh, get past the, the eagle and the turn up any shaped dolphin and go up just a little bit more, Roger. Other way, other way. There you go. Oh, See you go. the arrow right there, right there. Okay. So yeah. right here, if you're still looking. That's Sagita. And if I'm pronouncing it wrong, forgive me. S A G I T T A. Sagita is the arrow. Now, we saw an arrow in Sagittarius. Do you remember he had the arrow in his bow? He was ready to shoot the arrow at the scorpion and its heart and kill the enemy of God. That's not this arrow. This arrow is a different arrow. It's made up of 18 stars. It's a picture of the arrow of God that's been sent forth. Okay. Let me show you in scripture. Let's go to Yeshia. I mentioned Isaiah 53 just a bit ago. Let's start in Isaiah 53. I know it is slow. There we go. Okay, Isaiah 53, 
and verses three and four, and, I'm sorry, verses four and five in particular, uh, this whole chapter is a picture of the Lamb of God giving his life, the sheep, Isaiah 53. The, the sheep before the shearers, as I mentioned earlier. So it's talking about Messiah's sufferings. The rabbis today want to try to say that this speaks of the nation of Israel. I'll challenge you on your own. Read through the verses. Tell me when Israel as a nation acted like these verses. <coughs> it, you won't find it. So that excuse has to go out the window. Now look at it. Is this Yeshua? Did he do these things? Did he go through what we read in these verses? The history will bear out the end. Verse four, however, it was our sicknesses or our diseases that he himself bore, our pains that he carried, that we ourselves assume that he did afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated. It's hard for people to understand God striking someone down. Hold on with me through the whole picture and I think you'll understand, okay? That we see him stricken by God, humiliated. Verse 5 says he was pierced. So the, the way he was stricken was in a way of being pierced. He was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him. And by his wounds, by him being wounded by the piercings, we are healed. Now, if you are a believer and you know the whole picture, you've got it. You understand he was pierced by the nails so that he might shed his blood in our place. His blood put on the seat for atonement for our sins. Remember, Capricornus is the goat that would be slain for the sins of the people. A picture again. So here's how we see the arrow of God because obviously, clearly, he was struck down by God, not by man. Satan might have thought he did it. It does not say he was struck by Satan, does it? It wasn't. It doesn't say he was struck by the Romans who carried it out. It wasn't that, was it? And it wasn't the Jews who cried out, crucify him, that people want to still say the Jews should pay that price today for saying that then. I won't go off on that, but I won't. No, he was stricken by God. He was pierced for our offenses. Let's keep looking and get our whole picture. I've given you this scripture so many times that you might begin to have it memorized, and that's not a bad thing. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 talks about this piercing. It gives us more information. When we start in Zechariah, when we get to chapter 12 and we have the one speaking, we know it is God speaking. God's talking about on that day, he will destroy all the nations that come against the British Alliance. That doesn't mean that Yeshua, Jesus, doesn't do this. We know God and Yeshua are one. And we see them in, in two different roles in this next verse because actually we're going to see the triunity of God. We're going to see all three, our God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three at one, we're going to see all three playing a part in verse 10. God speaking says, I will pour out on the house of David. Where's the house of David? Or Israel in general, we got it. She said, Jerusalem, and I will argue with that. We know that the line of David alone, when his family line, came from Bethlehem, Bethlehem. But when we talk about the house of David, we're talking about the temple area. We're talking about that's in Jerusalem. We're talking about Israel, okay? It gets very specific. Here it says, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, I've just got to ask you, because there's those coming against us today. Where is Jerusalem? Thank you. <laughs> Jerusalem, comma, Israel. Not occupied territory, not West Bank. <laughs> Jerusalem, comma, Israel, not Utah. <laughs> not anywhere else, okay? We know we're talking to Israel, about Israel. God is going to pour out on Israel the Spirit. And notice it's a capital S in your, your uh, version. Okay, that's right. It should be. The spirit that's being poured out is the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of God. He's pouring out his spirit, his spirit of grace, his spirit of pleading. The Holy Spirit pleads for us. He pleads our case before God. He intercedes for us. He changes our prayers and makes them what they ought to be. And he extends the grace of God. 
all three are acting together. It's not three separate, it's tied together as one. So God's pouring out his spirit of grace and pleading so that they, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the house of David, the Jewish people, in other words, the nation, the nation, the land of Israel, so they will look at me, again, capitalized, they will look at me whom they pierce. Now, I told you I was God speaking. When was, and that makes me speaking of God. When was God pierced? On the cross, the crucifixion, the nails that pierced him, what we just read in Isaiah 53, and now what we're seeing in the gospel, the arrow that God sent out, that arrow isn't pointed at scorpion that arrow went and it pierced the son of god it pierced the one who it says they will mourn for him like one mourning for an only son do you remember isaiah 7 14 that unto them the son would be given the son we know is the son of god he is very god himself they're going to mourn because he, he is their only son they're going to mourn and weep bitterly over him like weeping bitterly over a firstborn. If you've lost your firstborn, if you've missed your firstborn, if your firstborn has died, you're in mourning. It's horrible any child that would die, but the firstborn, the only, it, this, this is going to cause them to mourn. Why? Because they're realizing at this point in time, they're realizing, wow, Messiah came. He died for us. We missed it. Oh, have we had only seen it? We could have been spared all the suffering that we've gone through, that the, the repercussions of our actions have taken place through the centuries and all the way down because this is going to come to fulfillment at the end of the tribulation, second coming of Yeshua. When they see him coming and realize, whoa, he's the one who was here before. He's the one who was here who was slain, he is the one who will be coming in all his glory. Remember I started and said in our last section, we're going to see Messiah coming in his glory. We'll get to that point. We'll get to Leo the lion, yay, the tribe, of the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who will come back in great glory. But here is the mourning that's taking place because the sun has been pierced, pierced by that arrow. <laughs> okay, let's mm. look at Psalm, to Helene 38 and verse 2. Psalm 38 and verse 2. And we read it there. This is on the human level, but again, when we don't want to think this God pierces, yes, he pierces our hearts that they be open to receive. We need the circumcision of our hearts, but not the circumcision of the flesh, but what will take place in the heart so that the heart of stone can be removed in the heart of flesh. That, that is one with God, at one atonement with God will be so. That will be the case. But be talking. Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath. This is verse, verse one. Don't punish me in your burning anger. Why would God be angry? Do you think he gets angry at sin? Do you think he gets angry when his people are rebellious and they're constantly turning their back on him, rejecting him? Yes, it's a righteous anger. It's not a mad anger or an anger. Love. It's a righteous anger, and yet the, the psalmist is pleading for for um, oh goodness mercy. <laughs> Sorry, folks, <laughs> for mercy. He's saying for your arrows have sent people. Okay, he's feeling arrow now. Trying to get rid of the interference. Okay, thank you. This arrow was shot at one. This is a singular arrow, and it went at one, and we just read that was to the Messiah. But this is telling us God sometimes allows arrows to hit us to feel the pain that we need to feel to awaken us that will get our hearts right before Him. So it's not a foreign thought, even on the human level. That's how God dealt with David. When David, David, had a heart that was not right with God and was doing what was wrong. He had to be pulled up short, and God did do that. Correction hurts. If you don't want the hurt, don't be in need of the correction. Stay straight. But again, this is the arrow 
that God sent to the Son. So the one who was willing to be pierced for us, okay? It's not the arrow Sagittarius has left the bow. That went to the enemies. This one went to the very Son of God. The arrow, did I tell you it's made up of 18 stars? It, yes. it, okay. Made up of 18 stars. It doesn't show all 18 on the chart. And it makes it look pretty straight. But when he calls up my picture, you're going to see what at least one of the pictures of Sagita that shows it's kind of a crooked arrow. There are other arrows in the sky that the other stars lined up straighter that could show it better. But this is the one that, that in relation to the others telling the story, this is the one that, that was shown uh, to be the arrow. Uh, what we need to see about it, okay, that's Capricorn, so it should be a Sagita. There you go. See how it's a little more bent in that picture? That's a little more accurate in the way it looks in the sky. It's not a straight arrow. It's bent. Uh, there's no reason that I can give you other than God bent it to go into the direction, you know, he had his target, okay? The Hebrew name, by the way, is Sham, S-H-A-M. It means destroying, or it could be Shamem, which is desolate. What we see is that this arrow has left the bow. You don't see the bow anywhere, do you? I'm going to draw your attention to the bow in a moment, but we don't see the bow anywhere in here. This arrow is appearing naked and alone. The shooter is invisible. You just see the arrow that's gone out. You don't see the shooter. You don't see the bow. It was God who afflicted the sun. We read that in Isaiah 53, and he is invisible. We do not see God. The same way when we look at Pesach and we look at the three layers of matzah that we know is representative of God. Remember, the, the middle piece comes out into view. When did God come in view? When he put on human form. But we never see God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in that human form. We see God personified, God the Father personified. We have hair and eyes and hands, but we know he's, he did not take on a human body. Only the sun took on that human body. So the invisible God has shot this arrow. That's why it's his bow, and you haven't seen it. But did I just give you a clue? Did anybody catch it? I've taught before and brought out to you, and I don't know if I have it with me here today to do it or not. I can try to do it justice, but notice what I called it. I called it God's bow, only I said his bow. Does that make anyone remember somewhere else in scripture? let you use your minds for a moment does anybody come up with anything if you've been with me i have taught it before so if something's coming back to remembrance don't be afraid to say it okay where do you see it in scripture you're on it but where do you see it in scripture good good you're coming up with it anyone remember it looks like i didn't bring let me take you to genesis chapter nine okay real quick there are sheets, chapter nine. You're all over it. If you couldn't hear what they were saying here in the classroom here, the Zoom room, yeah, the Zoom room, whatever. If you couldn't hear it, Roger said, bow, he says, his rainbow. Yes. Okay, where do we see it called his bow in scripture? And uh, Anne came up and said, Genesis, and she is right. In chapter nine, we have them coming out of the ark. The story of the ark starts, or, or, you know, the flat starts in chapter six. We're in chapter nine. When we get to Bereshit, Genesis verse by verse, it'll take its time in between, but we'll go through all that. But look with me, chapter nine and verse, okay. It looks like it's, there it is, 13. I knew I was too far. My eyes caught it in 14 first, but verse 13. I'm trying to see, let's start with 12, okay? God is speaking, and he says, this is the sign of the covenant. Remember what we learned about signs? The stars are signs. Sign means significant or signifying, and remember, often they're signifying of the one who is to come, the one who's going to come in all his glory. Well, here again, we have the sign. God's given something to signify, something that to be able to identify, to recognize, to say, hey, when I see that, that's a sign. I know what that means. 
We use signs all the time. If I drew you two golden arches, where is everybody going to go? McDonald's. That didn't take a lot. If I see in the fast food chain of thought and I put a crown on my head, where are we now? Burger King. Burger King. <laughs> okay. We do that. Nike's got a swoosh, and you know that's his tennis shoe. Nike's tennis shoe. Okay. Signs signify. God said, I'm making a covenant with you. When I make this covenant between me and you, and I laugh that God used it, he didn't put it in perfect English for us. He said it the way it is. The covenant starts with God, and it comes out of us. God says, I'm making covenant between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set, and the Hebrew literally says, I have set my bow. We're the ones that call it rainbow. That's fine. There's not a thing wrong with that uh, because it is a different word than the bow and arrow word. But I have set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall serve as a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. So when you look at God's arch that shot the bow, what are you looking at? The rainbow. The rainbow. And the rainbow is not in the stars it's not a star we're not going to come to constellation i'm not going to say here's the decon it's a rainbow no but the rainbow that is seen in the sky when we're looking at it we're looking up it's looking down it's bent looking down like the arrow's been shot to the earth right this rainbow you know it's somebody once said it's god's smile you know because to us it's a frown here but when we're looking up it's god's smile like better that we just keep it in context here. That bow facing toward Earth is what shot the arrow to Eden. God took His bow, shot the arrow. How do I get that? Look at the bow. Breath shed blood. Come to the next color. What's the next color? Gold? No. No. Green. <laughs> Give me a rainbow. <laughs> I think she had rainbows all over. And by the way, don't give them over to Satan who's trying to take them and warp their meaning today. We know that this is God's insignia first. Okay. Let me just take you from the, the reds, the hues of reds. Into, I, I'm all They're all over, but I'm not going to bother. Into the greens because green is growth. Green grass. Okay. That'll work. Thank you. Okay. All right. It does, it does give the yellows. The oranges and the yellows there. Okay, then we'll go in this order. So we've got the red, we've got, and actually this is flipped. This is when you have a double rainbow, you see it in these colors. It really should be this way, but I'll start, I'll keep you with the red. The shed blood is where it starts. Yeshua sheds his blood. Who is he? It's shown by the, the yellow or the gold. I forgot to hold it up close. Okay. All right. Thank you, Roger. I think everybody knows what a rainbow looks like anyway. Okay. He is fully deity. He is fully God and he is fully human when he's shedding his blood. That's why we see the orange and the gold blend them together. You've got the golden. He wears the golden crown. You walk on the streets of gold. It represents heaven. He came from heaven to shed his blood. Through his shed blood, we come into newness of life. Green, we think of sprouting forth. Think of spring. Everything starts turning green. We say it's the new life coming out of the death. A seed goes into the ground and it dies in that ground. It germinates in that ground. And it's a new life that springs out. A seed doesn't spring out. Well, it kind of does. But you know what I mean? It has within it. You know, it comes out and it's the flower that has seed that goes on. Anyway, there's your green. When we grow in the newness of our Lord, then we grow in like him. We are heaven bound. That brings us to the blue. It makes us think of the heavens. We will grow closer to him as we grow in our new life. And eventually we get to come into the presence of the royalty of our God shown by the purple. So you have from the rainbow, you have through his shed blood, the ability to come into his very presence in heaven. That was all made possible by the arrow that was shot because if the first didn't take place, that's represented by the red. If there was no shed blood, there's no rainbow. You can't have rainbow without the red. You can't have the rainbow without the, the, uh, the, it takes both the sun and the rain to make the rainbow. The rain part being this, this, the sad 
the note of piercing. The son, though, is the one who was pierced, who was able to take his life back up again and bring us into the very presence of our God. So that rainbow, and remember I've given it to you before, redemptive arch in never ending blessings of wonder, R-A-I-N-D-O-W. Or you might say the redeeming arch. You know, this is just a, an acronym that I've come up with to get the point across. Because he redeemed us, we come into the fullness of his blessings we just have, all we can do is wonder, just stand in awe and rejoice and thank God because the arrow was shot from his bow and the what, what he's done with his bow now, the work is done. He hung his bow up. He just hung it in the sky. It's done. The arrow's been shot. The work's been completed. What did Yeshua say on the cross? It is finished. Tell us die. Done over, paid in full. Nobody can come and say, uh uh, you owe. Nope, remember those scales? The price is fully paid. That's what comes out of this arrow that has been shot. The, really a question. That's a question? That's a question? Okay, who is it? <laughs> I've got a tiny little. Okay. I need to say one last sentence and then we'll get our last question while Roger's trying to unmute her. The death arrow of Almighty God is what brings justice on the unrighteousness of sin. That's what we see. That arrow, I'm going to tell you right now because it's in the area of Capricorn, is the arrow that felled the goat. Remember the goat's head's going down, he's going down in sacrificial death. It fell to the goat, got the, our sins on Messiah, on the cross. We read that in Isaiah 53. Remember, we read that it was our um, our sins. And you said the words, our, uh, oh, goodness. I know, I know, I know so well. Um, sorry. One more time. Uh, I think it said offenses was a word that was used. In verse 4. Our sicknesses, our pains, he was afflicted. Uh, he was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid on him. Okay, it uses different terminology, but we know what it's saying is our sins were put on him. That caused the death, but remember the other side of the goat head is the tail of the fish that's the newness of life, and it's the springing forth into newness of life. I don't remember why I have down here Matthew 27, 46. I haven't forgotten you, Arlu. I'll be right to you. I just want to finish my thought. Matthew 27 is the cross. Maybe that's where he said it is finished. I'll bet it is. No, 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 no. 27, 46. Oh, okay. 27, 46, because I brought out that the arrow is alone. In 2746, it's when the Lord cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? At that moment, when he became the sin offering was when God turned his back on the sin offering. He could not look on sin. And it was that moment of separation. To me, that was the agony of the whole cross, the agony of everything that he was suffering beforehand. As bad as the physical suffering was, it was the mental a holy God taking on sin for us, becoming that sin offering that caused the piercing. That remember, even his heart was pierced. We see that when the spear went into his side, the heart had been broken. Water and blood is what washed out, but it's water and blood that brings the refreshing. The water of the word, the shed blood that brings us that, that forgiveness of our sins so that we can one day be with him. All of this done. So the bow is hung. We every time you see a rainbow, remember that the work is done. He's accomplished it. Look at it as God smiling down on us because He is through the shed blood uh, that the arrow pierced our Messiah. I'll get you right after I get our Lou. Where'd our Lou go? Our Lou? Question? Barely. Is the bow? Uh, can how is the bow? of revelation uh where the the white the 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 man uh yeah the horseman on the white horse was carrying a bow not the arrow but the bow that is not a picture of messiah at all 
is misinterpreted that way because it is a white horse. People say, oh, that's the Lord. No, these no, no, no. are the horsemen of the bow. The bow. Right, right. But you have to start Whoa. with the fact of who it is. It's not Messiah, okay. it's Antichrist. The bow is a hunter's bow. It is a bow going out to shoot as in war. So his bow shows that even though he's speaking peace and flattering, he is a man of war. What follows in, in horseman number two is war, pestilence, death, etc. as we go through the four horsemen of Apocalypse, Revelation 6. So that is a different bow than when God says, I gifted my bow. It, it's, a, it's the different bow. That would be more like the bow that we saw Sagittarius have, that Sagittarius is a picture of the Lord shooting the enemy of sin and death for us. Okay? Good question. Good question. Okay. Yes, because it was also a sign of the covenant God was promising he'd never destroy humankind with a flood again. He'd never flood the whole earth again. I think he even said that, and we'll get into this when we're in Genesis verse by verse, that a flood had come over when it had been Satan's kingdom, and it brought that devastation that changed it, then he recreated what he did for, excuse me, man, and put man on, and then man became so evil. Every thought was only evil continually. We don't get it. I talked with someone about this today. We don't get it. We say we're in the days of Noah and we feel like it. And yes, we're on the edge of that. And I am going to tell you, man's thoughts are evil continually. Evil is filling the face of this, this earth, man's and humanity, the man. Yes. But when I say we don't get it, take a snapshot of Noah and the people around him. By the time he goes into that ark, there is literally one family on the face of the whole earth. And that family only has eight people that believe in God. No one else did by the time he goes onto the ark and God shuts the door. Can you imagine? I've got right here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I got a little less in my house, but if I add in all my Zoom family, we have more on Zoom today than Noah had. He, when he looked past his sons and their wives, and he looked past his wife, he couldn't find another human being that had a heart for God. Not one. Thank God for my spiritual family that's larger than that. But we are rapidly moving to that time. Will it come down to one family on the face of the earth again? No, it will not. Thank God he will not allow it to come to that point before he comes back and stops the rule of terror and evil. But I just want you to realize the severity of it. When it got so bad, and when it was brought down to just Noah's family, then that's who he put in the ark, preserved, and brought the judgment, the flood on the face of the earth. That's what he promised he wouldn't do again. So when this evil is getting that bad, that it, the scriptures tells us, as it was in the days of Noah, it will be when the Son of Man returns. That's why he doesn't just flood this world and kill off the people again he instead returns in human form and stops it before it comes down to even just one thing mercy of god mercy of god and those living through the tribulation or they are going to be praying for that day of his return if we ache for his return to get us out of this yuck now just imagine it on steroids wow wow okay um and I don't know if I'd make clear the, the arrow being in this place, in this sky, I believe is in relation to um, bringing the death of the goat, you know, showing that. But it, it's also going to be seen when we see all three, we're going to see that there's a falling eagle. What we're seeing here is that the work has been accomplished for the sacrifice. The death, the sin and the death, the work has been done. And that's what's being shown in Capricornus. That's why it can spring up into newness of life. So I want to make sure I've got that clear because we're going to go into this eagle that we're going to see looking as if he has fallen also, the smitten one falling. So the goat's been um, hit by the arrow 
it's as if the eagle has been also giving us the, the, the fullness of this picture. Okay, so are there any questions on Sagita or what I've said so far? Okay, I've got most people, although I can't see them anymore. So if you're in, in the silent, you can put up that hand and I'll catch that you have a question. All 12 are on, but you only see who's got the picture. Right, right, which is only half of them. So yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah, I caught it. Thank you, Roger. Okay, and I don't see any hands here. So we'll go on to Aquila, A-Q-U-I-L-A. -A. It means the eagle. When we were, where did my, uh, okay. Where, I, I, you know, I always forget to review and refresh. Help me find it real quick, Roger. Uh, it's not the, the one that looks like right a swan. Here. No, 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 that's the swan. That's the swan. Yeah, that's uh, Cygnus. We're going to learn about him later. Um, it looks a little less, a little more like an eagle. Oh, it's right there. It is It is near the arrow. I look too far. Right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. But the one above the arrow, that's going to be a swan. We're going to study that one later. But Aquila, yeah. So my apologies, Roger. You got it right. I thought that it was right around there. It's hard for me to see it looking like an eagle. Again, remember, it's how people draw their pictures. But this is Aquila. It means the eagle. And notice how he's going down. The same way that the head of the goat was going down, the eagle is going down. That's, that's different than our eagle, our master eagle that looks so majestic, that's flying, that soars up higher and, and soars up to the heights. This eagle is falling. It's a picture of the pierced. Remember, we're talking about the arrow piercing. The pierced, the wounded, the falling eagle is gasping in its dying struggle. That's why you see a funny looking mouth there. It's like it's gasping for its last air. In the uh, tail, or actually in the neck, in the neck is a star that means the wounding. I'm sorry? It's like a big star. Yeah, they're making it big. This is one of the bigger stars to, to show it. Um, the Hebrew name is Halal. And I'm going to take you to Tehillim Psalm 69 and verse 26. Psalm 69, verse 26, where we read, yes, the star in the neck means the wounding. Okay, it is the brightest star. Is Altair in the heat in the um, Arabic is, is where we get this one, the Hebrew name being Halal. Um, yeah, there's another, you can kind of see it looking like a bird that's going down. Um, it doesn't show as well the star in the neck. There you go, the neck you can see, yeah, there you go. That shows it well uh, in, in the pictures there. Psalm 20, I'm sorry, 69 verse 26. For they persecuted him whom you yourself struck, and they tell the pain of those whom you have wounded. So others have been wounded, but this one's been wounded by God. Remember that fits with him sending that arrow out. And that fits with Isaiah 53 and verse 4 where it tells us, and I'll read it for you again, where it's telling us that God is the one that has done this wounding. Now, it wasn't done to Yeshua in the sense that he couldn't say anything or do anything about it. It was with his willingness. He was a, a co-partner with God in this. Verse 4 again of Isaiah 53, the last part of it says, after it says he's been afflicted, struck down by God. Okay, Yeshua allowed it because he agreed with it. They chose together to, to perform this act. I hate to put it that way. It's not putting on an act that you understand what I'm saying. And it was with the willingness of the son. That's what I'm trying to say. So back to the wounding in the neck, the eagle going down, the eagle dying, the eagle gasping, that Red, that bright color there is from the Hebrew word halal. We come into the root word, not halal itself, but when we get into the chet and we go further back, we go into the root word, we get the meaning that it would be in, in the way to say it today would be scarlet colored or scarlet thread. Okay. Let me take you to Joshua, Joshua chapter two, and we'll go to verse 18. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 18. Unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down, 
and gather into your house, your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. The scarlet thread there is that same root word. What we're reading about in Yahshua, in jo Joshua chapter 2, is the story of Rahab, or you call her Rahab, the harlot. When they were about to, to take Jericho in victory, Rahab had faith in the God of Israel. And she asked that she, she not lose her life when, because she had hide the spies. She said, you know, she wanted her life spared because she had done right by standing with God in, by helping the, the Israeli spies. And they told her, okay, for you to survive, you need to put the scarlet thread out the window. Her house was on the wall. The walls were so thick they could put a house there. So her house is on the walls that are going to be falling down, but she's to put out this scarlet thread, this red colored thread. We're going to see, and we won't do it today, but sometime take a study of that through scripture. We're going to see when it talks about the scarlet, it's talking about the sins that when they're removed, they come as white as snow. What she in essence is doing is she's holding out, I believe in the shed blood of Jesus because I believe in him and his coming. And I'm, I show it by my actions to help his people. She's saying, I have faith in the God of Israel. And God said that is accounted to her in essence for righteousness. He knew she had a heart to believe in him, to believe in the God, who, the living God, not the false gods that others were worshiping. And her faith spared her and not only her, but all that she brought into her household because they were of like mind. It's like when Acts 16 tells us in all their house will be saved. Very often in those days and still in the jungles of today, very often as the head of the family goes, so goes the whole family. If the head of the family believes in all of the whole family will believe in all of it. If the head of the family comes to faith in Yeshua, he will lead the rest of his family and they will follow him in their own faith that they're covered by the head in essence. Um, in the picture that's being drawn. So we're seeing this same word now that carries that scarlet color. Um, it does not say it for me, but I have a sneaking suspicion. If we could get far, the, far out in space to see, it probably would be one of the red stars. Because remember, we have the different color stars. I'm assuming it's a red star because the name is indicating that redness. When we see that, that scarlet color, it's going to tie into another thought in just a moment. Some of you have heard it with me before, but for any who have not, or for those who have, I think you'll be blessed by hearing it again. But let me give you a little more fact. Just remember this. We're going to come back to this, this red color, the wounding neck there. Um, in its back, it has another star that, that the meaning of that star's name is wounded or torn. In the lower wing, the name of the star there is the piercing. Reminds us again of being pierced in the tail. It's the name that means wounded in the heel. Again, we're reminded of the prophecy in Genesis 3.15. We hear that again and again and again. It's like God laid down such a strong prophecy, the very first one. I feel like it's the foundation of all prophecy. He gave it all right there in 3.15, and then he gave hundreds of other prophecies proving piling on top of that foundation he laid but here we go again Yeshua was wounded in the heel in the sense that that was where in his human form he touched the earth his human body crucified god never died yeshua his body died his spirit did not today you will be with me in paradise said to the the thief on the cross we know this body is what we shed when we lose our life on this earth, but the spirit continues on. And we see that he was wounded only in his human flesh. That was all that Satan could kill was the human flesh. Beware of the one who can who can uh, kill, not kill. I'm trying to think how the scripture says it. Destroy the flesh and the spirit because your spirit can be sent into the fires of hell if you do not become a believer in Yeshua. That's the, the what protects you from hell. We know that. Anyway, you get the idea here completely. And one of the um, stars in the tail also, one of my sources um, 
said from the Hebrew word word akim, and I could not verify it, but it, it sounds reasonable that it means to lie in wait. And they get the idea from that is the betrayal that Yeshua experienced, that he would be betrayed. Uh, but this was all again, he allowed it. Did God not know? Of course he knew, but he allowed it so that Yeshua could suffer the death on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Psalm 40, 41 and verse 9, to Helene 41, verse 9, says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. I do believe that was a foreshadowing of what the Judas would do because he dipped in at the same time. The bread is actually the matzah, but it was the one who, um, Yeshua had told his Talmudim, one of you will betray me. And they were all questioning, is it me? Is it me? And he said, the one who dips with me is the one who will. And it was the matzah that was being dipped in the herosis because this was Passover. That's what they were eating. When Judas did this, Yeshua looked at him and said, what you have to do, go and do it quickly. He went off and sold out his master for 30 pieces of silver. And we know the rest of the story. So it does fit, whether it's verified by other sources or not, it's interesting that it does fit with the scripture. The eagle is also used of God in the Bible. We see it in different ways. Look at Exodus uh, 19 and verse 4, Shemot 19 and verse 4, Exodus 19, verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, God speaking to Israel. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Okay, that's seeing the eagle going up, that's seeing the victory. And we often see the eagle used in that way in scripture. Did God literally put the children of Israel on eagle's wings and bring them on little birds into the land of uh, promise? No, but we all get the intent, the picture that's being drawn there. It's further acknowledged when we look at Dabarim, Deuteronomy 32, verses 11 and 12. I think a lot of us know this picture. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, he spread his wings, he caught them, he carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided him, and there was no foreign God with him. The eagle, we know, kicks her little babies out of the nest. They're up there. It's been warm. It's been cozy. They've had uh, meals, well, not on wheels, but on wings, <laughs> brought to them. They've had need for nothing. They're liking where they are. The mama eagle knows they're going to keep growing and they're going to outgrow this nest and they need to be able to take care of themselves. And so when she senses that they are developed enough that their wings can begin to carry them, she kicks them out of that nest. All of a sudden, their world has gone upside down. It couldn't have felt good. It wasn't something that was easy for mama to do because she knows how her little eaglets are going to react. What are you doing to me? <laughs> and in their franticness, they start with their wings. And all of a sudden, they're realizing those wings are keeping them from crashing. Now, if they're not ready to handle it, they can't make it all the way. And often they can't the first time. They've got to strengthen. Mama gets right under them lifts them up on her wings and puts them back into the nest. They're back in their safety and their safe zone and they get to have another free meal and they get to feel comfortable again only to have it happen again. Some of us complain when our father <laughs> kicks our nest <laughs> and we go sprawling and we think, what are you doing to us? <laughs> and we lash out and complain. But the eagle mama knows those babies have got to learn to exercise their wings or they're not going to survive. When the Lord allows your world to be kicked, <laughs> it's not for your detriment. It's for your life. It's for you to grow in you and get stronger and able to take care of yourself, not ever independent from God. He will always be there. And notice it says he spread his wings. He caught them. He carried them on his pinion. Psalm 91, under the shadow of his wing, we are come to rest. He never makes us go 100% independent. 
mom and dad is their babies. They grow up and they go on and they have their own families. But God never does that to us. What a picture for us of God's protection and God's safety. Even in this eagle going down, what we think is devastating, we're going to see is actually God's provision. And I think you know that already. Yes, ma'am. Oh, 32, Deuteronomy 32, verses 11 and 12. That's double ring in our, in our Hebrew. Now, the eagle is seen as a royal bird. Also, we know that. Do you know what the natural enemy of the serpent is? And all women, radar go up, hear this, because I think with almost without exception, there's still that enmity between the serpent and the woman to this day. They give us the creeps, right? <laughs> For most of us, anyway. The natural enemy of the serpent is the eagle. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. The eagle is, is very um, tender toward its young. The eagle mama is even said when it's necessary, she will tear her own body and nourish her babies with her own blood when all else has failed to see that, that her babies survive. What does that make us think of? What do we think of, of one who was willing to shed his own blood that we might have life? Let me take you to Hebrews, a very good Jewish book. Hebrews chapter 9, key word for Hebrews is, where's my students? No, no. Key word for Hebrews? The whole book of Hebrews, the key word. It, no, no, no. Faith is good. And faith is seen in Hebrews, but there's a key word for Hebrews. It's been a long time since I taught Hebrews. I thought that I, I can see the wheel string. Okay, let me give it to you. The key word for Hebrews is better. Better covenant, better blood, better house, better sacrifice, better, 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 better. Okay, we have a it all laid out to us, given to us, is reported for us in the, the um, Tanakh, in the original covenant, that it was all foreshadowing the better that was coming, Yeshua being the better. All the way through every chapter that you're reading in Hebrews, just put that word in your mind and you'll see it's better. Here in chapter 9, we're being told about the better blood. It's not through the blood of goats and calves but through his own blood, speaking of Yeshua Jesus, that he entered the holy place once for all time, having obtained eternal redemption. Now you show me where there was eternal redemption by the blood of bulls, goats, or sheep in the um, tabernacle or even in the temple. Do we see it? No, it was always temporary. When does Yom Kippur come around? The Day of Atonement. When does it come around? Once for all? Day of Atonement is every year on the Jewish calendar. The high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies every year and put blood on the altar. He never could say to God, oh, I don't need to go into the Holy of Holies this year on Yom Kippur. I did that. It's been done. God commanded every year. But when Yeshua came, the greater, the better high priest, coming with the better blood, his perfect sinless blood, putting it on the better mercy seat, the one in heaven, he obtained, as it says here, it wasn't by the blood of bulls and goats, and it wasn't, but it was through his own blood, he entered the holy place in heaven once for all time, obtaining eternal redemption now he says there's blood permanent on the mercy seat in heaven sinless blood kept, it doesn't cover it washes away all other sin now it's death it's eternal it's forever that is finished the, it, the job is done the blood has been placed perfect blood it meets the standard of the holy righteous god now heaven's doors can be open and we can come in through that shed blood. It is complete. It is done. It is the better blood. It is the blood 
that nourishes us all. How did he do it? He tore his own body, shed his own blood. That better blood, they would put it on the, the uh, holy places forever. The holy holies that is forever also. Let me take you to one thing else now. Remember the wounding? What verse that was? Hebrews 9, verse 12. Hebrews 9, verse 12. Remember the wounding, the red blood, the scarlet thread, the net? And I said, we can take that scarlet thread all the way through scripture, and you'll see that it's always a picture of atonement. And I've taken you to the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus here. Let me tell you that in this Hebrew, when we go to the original um, word in the Hebrew that gives us this scarlet, this, this crimson color or this scarlet color, the word is tola ot, T-O-L-A apostrophe A-T. Now, literally, the tola ot is a worm. Sorry, I'm thirsty. It's a worm. Let me take you and show you. Go to Psalm 22, just real quick for a moment. Psalm 22, Tehillim 22, is a picture crucifixion. No one argues that. Um, it starts out with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where did I read you those words? Did I not read them to you in Matthew 27? And it said, this is what Yeshua said on the cross at the moment that he became the sin uh, sacrifice for us. So right there, we know this is echo, echo. As soon as he cried those words out on the cross, every good Jewish student of their own scriptures should have gone, where did I hear those words before? Those are familiar words. That was prophesied. That was foretold. As we go on and we read, and I'm not going to read the whole, you can read Psalm 22 on your own. You will read, um, especially when you get down, verse 14, poured out like water, bones out of joint, heart like wax, it, 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 tongue clean to the jaws. All of this as you read it on down, they tell you this is what happens when crucifixion, when a body's crucified, okay? So much so, no one argues. Everyone who reads Psalm 22 says, yeah, that's a picture of crucifixion. Well, here's your kicker. Psalm 22 was written being generous, being safe, at least 700 years before the mode of crucifixion for death came about, before it was even a thought in man to kill another man in this way. It was described. Wow. Now, notice a key verse when you have all that in your mind. Verse 6. When we know, verse 1 told us, this is the Lord crying out. This is the Lord speaking. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's still the one speaking in verse 6. And he says, but I am a worm and not a person. A lot of people have looked at that through the time of God. Why does the Lord called himself a worm. He's not a worm. He's not a little slithery thing in the dirt that you pull up and go fishing with. <laughs> Why is he calling himself a worm? Well, here's your answer. Tola Ot is a specific worm. It is the word given here in Psalm 22, 6. It means crimson. It means scarlet. It gives us that color. Let me tell you about the Tola Ot. Because it's not in there. It's not a picture in the, the decons in the sky. This the picture we have is the eagle that is wounded. It has that Tola Ot could be the name of that star, but it's not. It, it gave it a, a name meaning the wounded or the wounded. But uh, but it also gives that connotation of that crimson color, that scarlet color. That's what ties it in to seeing it as the scarlet color here. That's what we see happening on the cross. That's what we see when we talk about this worm. The Tola Ot is a worm that gives birth one time in her life. Before she gives birth, she when she knows she's about ready to, she attaches herself 
usually to a tree. It can happen to wood anywhere, so it can happen to a fence, but usually it's to a tree. So I'm going to just use the scenario of the tree. She attaches herself to the tree so strongly, oozes out a, a secretion. She's so strongly glued to that tree that literally you cannot take her apart from the tree again. If you pulled it off the tree, it would die, okay? She's gonna give her life here. This is going to be the end of her life. When she's attached herself to that tree, under her, she gives birth to her babies. Her babies, the worm, the tola'at, the worm, okay? The crimson worm. She nourishes her babies with her own blood, with her own body. And in doing so, she dies. As she's doing this, she exudes this, 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 uh, I used the word just a second ago, this, this, well, she oozes, whatever she's oozing is a crimson red color. Her, her blood that's coming out, what she's oozing that's coming out, that's nourishing her babies is crimson red. It stains the babies crimson red. Remember, she was a crimson red worm when she attached herself to that tree. You saw her color. That's how she got her color was by the death of her mama on her when she gave birth to her. She stays attached to that tree. Get this. <laughs> God, you're awesome. For three days. In those three days, she gives her life and she dies. This is a real thing. It's science proves this. Call up the Tola'at in, in uh, your studies, you know, go to your internet or whatever. Science tells you, science teaches you about the crimson worm. Okay, and that's what they'll call it, the crimson worm, but the Hebrew word is Tola'at. And Roger's trying to call it up for us. <laughs> Trust me, let me finish the picture. She, for three days, she's been attached to that tree. She's given birth. She shed her blood, she's oozed the secretion, and she has died. When she has died, her body falls off of the tree. The babies are now free to go, and they've been nursed, they're able to go on their own. And the tree is stained crimson red, the okay. same color that she excreted. And here he's showing you pictures. I don't know where the crimson worm is found. I don't know if it's all over or not. And you know what? Um, I have to take back one thing, okay? I don't, I think I misspoke. The three days are what happened now. So I don't know how long she has stayed on that tree and nourished the babies. I have to take that part back, okay? Because it's three days later that this, crimson stain on this tree that's been red turns white. That's what happens three days later. So I don't know how long she fed him, maybe shorter, maybe longer. I don't know. I should, I'm sorry, I should have gotten that right, but that's what turns white. Now, very interestingly, if they take the crimson one, yeah, if they take, if science takes and scoops off that secretion, it has healing properties in it. And one of the things that they use it for is the rhythm of the heart. And that's what turns white three days later. Come let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's Isaiah 1, 18, and it even repeats it. I always have trouble saying it this, the second time I try to get it memorized. That they're so similar. I always confuse them when I'm in my mind like this. Uh, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, though they are toa'at, they shall be like wool. Do you see a beautiful picture of our Messiah in that? Who secretes, gives his blood to give life to those who come to faith in him? who get a new heart, the rhythm of the heart. I see a beautiful picture of our Messiah. And with that in mind, 
going back to Psalm 22, I have absolutely no question why the Lord says, I am a woman. He's not saying he's the fishing worm that you go fishing with. He's saying, I am the Torah. He, exactly. When the worm fastened to the tree, it was a picture of the Lord fastening himself to the cross, where he would stay and stand the rest of his life. Oh, you saved other people. If you're God, get off that cross and save yourself. Do you know how hard I think it must have been for him not to zap them <laughs> or, or not to say, I'll do it to show you. <laughs> but he didn't because he was gone and he was dying out of choice, not because he had fallen victim to their, their doings, to the ridicule, to their doings. But what a picture we have of our Messiah wounded for us. The crimson color wound in the eagle falling down. The eagle being the one who will tear her own body and with her own blood nourish her babies. And the crimson worm, the Tola Ot, being this complete picture for us. I just go, wow. It's still real hard to fathom it. To yeah. fathom it. God has put it in so much in creation. There are so many ways, you know, it's so critical. He wants it in every way you look at it so you can't miss it. If you don't get it this way, let me give it to you this way. If you can't get it this way, let me give it to you this way. So he shows us in science, in creation. He shows us in prophecy. He shows us in every which way. He gives pictures. He gives words. He gives word pictures, our parables and our stories, every which way, because he does not want us to miss the gospel truth. That's our God. Every which way. If I'm trying to help a student understand and that student has a background in a certain area, the best thing I can do is relate to them in that area. If I take someone who's a little bit older, let's say that they're in high school, they're really into sports and they can't get something and they need to be tutored. The best way that person can tutor is take it and apply it to a game. And all of a sudden they've got the attention of that sports person and that sports person can begin to relate and they begin to say, oh, okay, the ball is this and the people are that. And they begin to get the picture. This is what our God did. Every which way, no matter how you come at it, no matter whether you grow up in the jungles or you grow up in a science home or you grow up in a wealthy home or you grow up in, in a poor home, you have the same opportunity to know and to understand the gift of salvation. God doesn't leave it to chance. That's why he gives us so many prophecies. And I forgot I was going to open with that and I don't know that I wanted to do it right now. Maybe I will right now. Maybe it does fit right now. This comes out of a book called The Case for Jesus the Messiah. Again, God did not want it to be up for grabs, anything that we could question about. He told us there was going to come one Messiah who would bring salvation, okay? We specifically say the Messiah. There are many who want to call themselves a Messiah, and there will be those who say they are the Messiah, but there is only one who can carry that title, the Messiah, the Savior, of the world, the one who came from God, who is God, who came to fulfill what God had given him to do, which was to give his life to bring us this redemption. We're going to tie it all up when we get to um, our very next decon, which is going to be Dolphinus. It's, it's going to be the rising, and you see it right there. Roger set it up there already. It's, you're going to see as a fish rising up out of the water. We're going to get that part. I just tell you that ahead. But let me sidetrack for a moment. As I'm saying that God left nothing for choice, he didn't want anybody to be able to question who the real Messiah was. This is too important. If someone follows the wrong one, thinking they're following the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's going to be their salvation, and they get it wrong, it costs them their life. So the Lord spelled it out. God spelled it out. He gave 
and I told you last week, we went through it last week, he gave specifics. Remember I said, if you had to get a message to somebody and you needed to know you didn't give it to the enemy, you got it in the right hands. And we went through that whole scenario, uh, you know, picking a specific location, a specific time, a specific place in that location. I, I used McDonald's by the time I was done, if I remember it all, we had McDonald's on 40th Street at 11 o'clock on a Friday, the food farthest from where you pay for your food. A person sitting there with a green shirt and a cowboy hat, I think, let's put a feather in it today. <laughs> okay. All these different layers so that when all of that came together, they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's why God gave so many prophecies, over 300 prophecies. It would be like having 300 different fingerprints and the science says fingerprints don't lie. If I've got your thumbprint, it matches your thumbprint and I've got 300 of those, I know I've got the right one. So that's what God did. Well, that he would be, yes, on the cross. Yes, yes, in all these different ways. But he gave it specifically. And I don't think I brought it down with me. I didn't. Um, I can run upstairs and get it, but we'll see. We'll see if I need it. Let me let me just give you. No, I didn't. I thought I had it for a moment. Um, that was something else I was going to bring out for others, but I can bring it out later. Uh, I don't think I realized I was going to get off in this direction today. But when I gave it, let me just make it. I'll give you the start, okay? The Messiah, the one who would come, who would die for our sins. First of all, had to enter into the human race. He had to be human. That knocks out all the non-human saviors, okay? Then he had to be born in the seed of a woman. We see that in Genesis 3.15. We see the miraculous seed because a woman doesn't have seed. Then he had to be of the line of Abraham. He had to go from Abraham to Isaac. He had to go from Isaac to Jacob, okay? Well, Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael. So now you're following only through this line. You're, you can take out Ishmael and his family and not worry about them. Follow Isaac. Then Isaac had to come to his son Jacob again, split off from Esau and all his descendants. Then he had to come through his son. He had to come from the tribe of Judah, Judah. Okay, and he kept going down. These are what I'm talking about: 300 specific prophecies. He had to be born in Bethlehem. I want to say so respectfully to. A dear sect of, of uh, they're, they're the Orthodox persuasion, okay? They sincerely want to worship God, but they're sincerely wrong. And they look to this rabbi named Schneerson, who they thought he came from a long line of rabbis. There was no successor after him. They were sure this last one had to be the Messiah to the point that when he died, they waited for his resurrection because they even accepted the fact that there's going to be a Messiah who dies and resurrects. But yet that wasn't Yeshua. That's their argument anyway. I wanted so just respectfully to say to them, but how could it be Schneerson? He was born in Brooklyn, New York. That's not Bethlehem, Israel. <laughs> right there, he got disqualified. Right there. That the Messiah who comes from God would be born in Bethlehem, would be born of the house of David, would be born of the tribe of Judah, would be born out of the side of Jacob, out of the side of Isaac, out of Abraham, who God promised through him all the world would be blessed. How does Abraham bless the whole world? Through the Messiah. The Messiah's blessings to all who will come in. That's what I'm saying. There's over 300 of these. Not only where he'd be born, what family line he'd be in. And I asked us before, how could we, any of us, choose who's going to be our mamas and our papas and where we're going to be born? <laughs> we get told we don't get to choose, okay? Well, by the time you get down to just eight, just eight prophecies, okay, there's 300 plus. Let's just look at eight and let me give you this from the scientific viewpoint, okay? And I will start, okay, after examining eight different prophecies, just eight, and you can pick any eight of the Messiah you want. If Yeshua Jesus, the one I call the Messiah, if he did not do any one of the 300 plus prophecies, bring it to my attention, 
and we'll throw all of this out. But I guarantee you, he fulfilled every single prophecy. Now, there are prophecies in scripture referring to his second coming. He will still fulfill those. Those are unfulfilled yet. I'm not saying every single prophecy in scripture has been fulfilled, but everything in connection with the Messiah and his first coming to suffer, to die, and to raise has all been fulfilled. You can't give me one that he didn't do. But I'm just going to take you to the probability of one person filling eight of those prophecies, fulfilled. Okay? The chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies is, and I'll put it into the math now, one in 10 to the 17th power. So you have one chance in 10,000, thousand, 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 draw a 10 and put 17 zeros after that number one, okay? That's a pretty huge number. Can we wrap our mind around that? Let me help you. Let me illustrate how large number of 10 to the 17th power is. Imagine covering the entire state of Texas with silver dollars to level a two feet deep. Okay, Texas is a good size state. We're going to cover it two feet deep. The total number of silver dollars needed to cover the whole state would be 10 to the 17th power. So by the time you've got two feet of silver dollars all over the state, you've if you counted each one of those silver dollars, you would have counted 10 with 17 zeros after. Okay, now choose just one of those silver dollars, mark it, drop it from an airplane, and then thoroughly stir all the silver dollars all over the state. When that's been done, blindfold one man. Tell him he can travel wherever he wishes in the state of Texas, but sometime he must stop, reach down into the two feet of silver dollars, and try to pull up the one specific silver dollar that's been marked. Want to be that man? Want to try that? The chance of his finding that one silver dollar in the state of Texas would be the chance the prophets had for eight of the prophecies coming true in any one man in the future. That's pretty phenomenal. Okay? In financial terms, is there anyone who would not invest in a financial venture if the chance of failure were only one in 10 to the 17th power? Well, that's the kind of sure investment we're offered by God for belief in this society. Take it to the bank, in other words. It can't be wrong. There isn't a chance it's going to be wrong. Okay, let me give you one more because it's not just eight prophecies. Let's go to 48 prophecies now, okay? 48, we still, I could take you to 300, but I'm going to stop at 48. So I'm not even at one third of the prophecies fulfilled. And by the way, I think he fulfilled, I can't remember, it's a huge number of how many he fulfilled just on the day of his death. And here again, how could he be dictating to people what to do while he's dying on the cross? Did he have? that ability could he say to those soldiers don't rip up my robe gamble for it instead no he didn't he went, didn't send out orders and they followed but they did exactly what the word of god said they would do so if we had one person fulfilling 40 prophecies that's 10 with are you ready 157 zeros after 10 to the 157th power that one person could fulfill 48 prophecies. So how can I put that into a picture we can understand? <laughs> sure. Let's try to illustrate it using the number of electrons. Electrons are very small objects. They are smaller than atoms. The atoms made up of electrons and neutrons. It would take two and a half times 10 to the 15th power of that laid side by side to make one inch. So it's less than a grain of sand for an electron, okay? Even if we counted four electrons every second and counted day and night, it would still take us 19 million years just to count a line of electrons one inch long. Okay, so electrons are pretty small. It's pretty hard to count them. 
the how many electrons would it take if we were dealing with 10 to the 157th electrons? Imagine building a solid ball of electrons that would extend in all directions from the Earth a length of 6 billion light years. The distance in miles of just one light year is 6.4 trillion miles. Am I blowing your mind? I've blown mine. This, for the prophecy this is for the prophecies, yes. That would be a big ball, but it wouldn't be big enough to measure 10 to 157 electrons. It's still smaller than that, this ball that I've just described. In order to get to 10 to the 157th electrons, you would have to take that ball of electrons reaching the length of 6 billion light years long in all directions and multiply it by six times 10 to the 28th power. How big is that? It's the length of space required to store trillions and trillions and trillions of the same gigantic balls and more. In fact, the space required to store all these balls combined together would just start to scratch the surface of the number of electrons we would need to really accurately speak of 10 to the 157th power. But assuming you have uh, some idea, the number of electrons we're talking about, now imagine marking just one of those electrons in that huge number, stir them all up, and put one person to travel in a rocket for as long as he wants, anywhere he wants to go, tell him to stop, and segment a part of space. Take a high-powered microscope and find the one marked electron in that segment and his chances would be one in 10 to the 157th If one person fills eight prophecies, the chance of that happening is the silver dollars in the state of Texas. If one person fills 48 prophecies, you have to go to the electrons, 6.4 billion years, go out in a rocket, pick out a segment of space, take a microscope and find that one marked electron. That's the, the probability of that happening is a probability that one person could fulfill 48 prophecies. So if you have one person who has fulfilled eight, that same one person fulfilled 48, I haven't even gotten to 300. That's so far off the charts, they can't even give us a math way to understand it the chance of it being not that one person is impossible. The chance of it being a fake person, a, a false Messiah is not possible. You can knock out everyone who says that they're Messiah by whether they fulfill the prophecies or not. Yeshua said he was the Messiah. Did he fulfill the prophecies? Yes, he did. So the chance of it not being him is astronomically impossible. I'm not talking about time. I'm talking about space. Space. When we went to the electrons, we went to the space. We had to go to the outer space because the Earth wasn't big enough to show. 10 to the 157th power, which is the chance of one person fulfilling 48 prophecies. If I made a list today and I said, there's going to come a person, he will be born. There's 300 ways to identify. I didn't give you 300 for McDonald's and the, I gave you maybe the eight, okay? But I'm gonna give you 300 ways to know who he is. That's the chance of one person doing all those 300 is 10 to the 157th power, okay? So when I look at those prophecies, those 300 prophecies, and I see Yeshua, Jesus didn't miss one. There's not one, oops, he didn't do this. Remember I said, Schneerson, you can't be Messiah because you weren't born in the right place. It knocked you out before you even got started. So... If I can find one person historically who lived, who fulfilled every single prophecy 
that the scriptures told us he would, then I've got a case. I've got fact. I can take that into a courtroom and they're going to say, you're right, he's the Messiah. That's how much proof there is. That's why when we see all this, the crimson worm, when we see all the, the different, every which way we turn, God hasn't left it a chance. He hasn't left a room for you to doubt or to wonder or to be misled and follow the wrong leader to the wrong place. He hasn't given you a chance to fall into the enemy's hands. He's given you everything you need to be secure and safe in believing that Jesus is the Messiah. And I stake my life on it. I stake my eternal life on it. I can stake all of your lives on it. If I didn't know this for fact, I wouldn't teach it to you all. I would say, go search, find, seek, come back. We'll study it together. But I don't do that because it's been proven and proven and proven and proven. And I will ask anyone who wants to deny it to pick out a prophecy, your choice, and prove that Yeshua Jesus did not do it. Prove he wasn't born in Bethlehem. Prove he didn't die of crucifixion. Prove that they didn't, instead of shredding his coat, gamble for it so that one would get that prize. Choose all these different things. And if you want to say, oh, well, the resurrection, there's even proof of that. If you're willing to believe it, more proof of it spoken and recorded by eyewitnesses and recorded in the time that anyone could have called it out. And do you really think 11 men or 10 men would have followed to a martyr's death if they knew they had hidden away his body? If they knew it wasn't true, do you really think they'd be willing for their families to buy some of them with them and they themselves and on and on it goes? No. No, there's no way it would be called out. Emma, like I told you before, we all accept that George Washington was a real person. Did you see him? No, but it's recorded in history. Well, hello, there's more recordings of Yeshua raised from the dead being seen than there is recording George Washington's a real person. But yet the whole world will accept George Washington and reject Jesus' resurrection. It's a willful choice to blind their minds to the truth that God has presented. Let me bring you back in before we close, because we should be closing out. Let me bring you to Dolphinus, uh, the, the third decon under uh, Capricornus, because this is the one we've had the eagle going down. We had Sagita, the arrow that pierced. So we've got, we don't want to leave it on the, the death note. We don't want to leave it on the negative. Dolphinus, the dolphin, Roger, if you want to call up Dolphinus for us. Um, oh, and if you're looking on this chart, while well, he's calling up other pictures, it was very close to the eagle. Below the Sagita, yeah, there you go. Whoops. Go over, go over just a little bit. Other way, other way, other way, other way. There you go. There's Selfinus. It, it looks like, oh, no. yeah, there you go. That's, that's a dolphin, okay? That's the way they drew it. And then he'll pull you up pictures on the other side to begin to show you Delphinus. 18 stars. It accents the tail of Capricornus, okay? Remember Capricornus had the tail of the fish. Now we got a whole fish here, okay? I, I call it a dolphin because of the sound of the name, but it's a fish here, okay? See the, the fin, it's a fish, okay? This is the dead one rising again. Remember the eagle's going down, gasping for breath. This is the dead one rising again. Um, the original name was Dollar. D-A-L-A-H, and that meant drawn out, meaning drawn out of the water. It's the fish jumping out of the water. That was the original name and the original picture. Now, where the eagle's going down and we're seeing that depth, the head downwards, the dolphin or the fish, it's always got its head <coughs> hanging up when we see it in the stars. And the fish is full of life rising up, leaping, springing out of the sea is as if the sea is the picture of death and coming up out of the sea is the picture of life. We say it in our picture of baptism. They go down in the waters of death. They come up into the newness of life. We show it as that in the same way. Dalit being meaning the pouring out of the water 
or the drawing out of the water, the rising out of the water literally is a picture of resurrection. So even though the arrow has been shot, it pierced the when it was to shoot. We see a picture by Capricorn who is the goat sacrificing his life. We see an eagle who tore her own body to nourish the babies, to nourish those who would be her, her, her children. Even though we see all that, we are taken in Dolphinus to the complete picture. We are taken to the resurrection. We are taken to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 4. That's why I could not end on this today. Hold tight, we're almost done. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 says that he was buried and that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He never stayed dead. Even the, the body that, that died was resurrected into a new resurrected body, like we'll have one day also, a body that doesn't suffer um, sin and death. Romans 6, 3, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Messiah Yeshua, into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism and a death so that just as Messiah was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in the newness of life. Let me read the next verse too. For we become united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So here we see our complete picture. That was Romans 6, whoops, uh, that was Romans 6, 3 to 5. Let me take you back to Romans, there we go, Romans 4, verse 25. It also ties in here, and I really am almost done, just a sense or two, and it will be. He was delivered over because of our wrongdoings and was raised because of our justification. To justify us took the resurrection. It took the coming back, not just paying the price, which was death, but conquering death for us. This is a picture of Alphenus. We are brought back into, or not back into, we are brought into newness of life. Now, it's very interesting in Dolphinus, and Roger set it up here now in the form that they see more in the stars. It's on my left. Um, it's that, that, yeah, see the four, circle the four, the diamond shape. Yeah, right there. That's what I'm going to talk about for a moment. In modern astronomy, that distinctive pattern is always seen. It's, it's like a diamond-shaped asterism is what they call it. It's um, so easy to see that, that most of the time they can see it even just with binoculars when, when it's in the sky where they're seeing it. It's very, it stands out in Dolphinus, these four, okay? That four, the four star shape there, it has a name. It's known as Job's Coffin. Joe's coffin, C-O-F-F-I-N, oh, coffin, like what they bury a body in. Yeah. Nobody knows why it's called that. All they know is that the name has been passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down. Some call it today a four-star sarcophagus. And if you've ever been to Israel, you know a sarcophagus is a coffin. It's what they bury the body in. It, it's Dolphinus. It's in the middle of Dolphinus. You can't see the star shape there well. Um, I, in fact, I really can't pick it out in the, the picture on your chart. But look at it in the reel and you can see. It must be in that head shape in there. It must be in that part. Um, maybe it goes into, I don't know where, because I can't see it in that picture there. But when you look at the real Dolphinus, in the sky with your binoculars, you will see four predominant stars that are diamond shaped that they call Job's coffin. I find it interesting that Job being one of the earliest Bible characters and we know about his walk with God. I wonder if that's why he got credited with it all the way back from his day. I don't know, but it's just a very interesting fact that they see the coffin brought Death brought out, life brought out of death. I kind of say it the right way, life brought out of death. So if we recap book two, chapter one are the blessings that are procured, the blessings that are, are um, procured, we're able, are, are, I don't want to say purchase, procure, they, they, he was able to gain them. I'll put it that way, to gain them. 
by his death and resurrection. It's seen by the seagull being slain, the goat of atonement, smitten by the arrow of the invisible God, falling in death like the eagle, but rising out of the dead like the dolphin, coming out of the coffin, coming out of the sarcophagus. And now we'll go into chapter two, which are the blessings and shirt. Okay, and that's where we'll pick up next week. So I know I ran a few minutes over, but I wanted to give you, yeah, there you go. See the dolphin shape? So that's where it needs to be near the eye. They just did not do a good job on our chart of drawing the four stars um, in it, but that shows you where it is. Thank you, Roger. I forgot that I had that. That's where it is in the, the eye and the, the head of the dolphin. Dolphin is where you find Job's coffin. Job's coffin. So I hope it's been a blessing to you today to see the complete picture. What our Messiah has done for us is amazing. How he has given it to us, how he has detailed it, how he's shown it specifically, how he takes all of his creation and shows the picture of the truth. I just stand in awe and I say, hallelujah, praise to our God. Is he not an awesome God? Could you think this up? Could you write all this kind of detail and make all this up and have it? Yeah, the, the, the way that it is always fact, always true. There is no room for doubt. How we can even know the Bible is the word of God, prophecy, and the pictures carried out. So it's interesting up for me. Questions, comment? Well, questions, and then we'll we'll go to prayer. Maybe we're at close in prayer. And then we'll go to questions and comments, okay? So, Roger, I'll let you be ready to bring up the audience so we can see them and unmute them. But let's close in prayer. Oh, count the board. Almighty God, you are beyond our ability to think or fathom or understand or even really relate to. Thank you, you took on him a form that we can relate to Yeshua Jesus, that we can see in him the death, burial, and resurrection that gives us that newness of life. Thank you that you did it all and that we simply accept your free gift and we are born into that newness of life. Thank you that you have procured it for all time, that it's not for a year, it's not for a few years, it is for ever, that we are eternally saved through the atoning work that you as the one did for us that you as the eagle slain by the arrow sent from God, you are the one who is raised in that newness of life, the dolphin to bring it to us. And for this, Lord, we say hallelujah. Praise you. Thank you. We jump up and down for joy, and we cannot wait to express our love face to face with you. Thank you. That one day we know that will be true, just as we know your first coming was true to every detail. You are awesome and amazing, and we praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus.